thanks everyone for um, taking time out again um, for our latest community hangout. Um, the focus for today is on facilities. Um, so we've talked about facilities um, briefly on a couple of our previous calls, and in particular, I think at the end of November last year. Um, and at, at that call, uh, we took away a couple of actions to um, find some ways to move forward with the uh, facility side of the, the data standards, um, which we, we have we've done. So part of this is checking in on some of the work that we've been doing um, and also to get, get some early feedback on um, a couple of proposals of how to revise the uh, existing specifications. So uh, let me just share my uh, slides with you. Okay, um, if you can see those okay. So yeah, to the agenda, um, the way I was gonna run through things was to um, first you talk about the general requirements uh, that have come up during some of the previous uh, discussions. So you can see what I've been using to inform the, the proposal. Um, we can skip through the proposal. I've got a few examples of uh, changes that I think we need to make in order to support facilities. Um, and then also, depending on how much time we've got, um, run through um, some of the uh, review we've been doing around the active places data to see, look at the alignment between that and the existing specifications and how it could be better used um, by people who, who are using the opportunity data. Uh, and then if we've got time at the end, uh, any other business that people want to raise. Okay, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step through these slides. Um, Stop, stop me and ask questions at any point um, rather than waiting to the end because I think we'd be better to get uh, comments as we go. So um, I, I went back over um, the discussions that we've had so far and it feels to me like there is two, two distinct um, user needs around facilities uh, and that they're focused in two different areas. Firstly, there's the need that I think Active Places is already fulfilling, which is um, the need for data that describes places and locations where people can take part in activities. So it's just, you know, kind of where leisure centers are, what equipment they have, um, and some basic information, you know, contact details, that kind of thing. The other need that has been highlighted is data that describes the availability of facilities. So that the, the key example being, I want to book a squash court or I want to book a, a um, table tennis table. Um, at the moment, um, we don't support that uh, in a useful way. Um, but that's what is the latter piece that I want to focus on in the first half of the, the discussion. So um, looking at the uh, facility availability side, what I've done is try to capture what I think the use cases are as just simple questions that we need to be able to ask of the data that is being published in order to support um, the kinds of applications that people want to want to build and then I've tried to turn that into some uh, specific requirements that we can then use to drive changes to the specs. So uh, based on the discussion it seems like we need to be able to identify what facilities are available at a location. So does, does it have a squash court? How many squash courts? Um, what activities can be carried out in a particular facility? So this touches on a, a, a kind of brief discussion we had around that a sports hall could be used in a variety of different ways. So we might want to kind of flag up that uh, a particular facility could be booked for different purposes. Um, we need to know where facilities are. So, you know, how do I find this squash court? Where is it? What's the address? Um, and then getting into the availability, uh, what dates and times can I book this squash court? So what people are, are called slots. Um, and then for a given slot, um, or given time, is this squash court still available? So those seem to be the key, the key questions. Um, if, if there's anything else that springs to mind, then, then shout, and we can make a note. But I've um, turned those into basically three broad requirements, um, things that we will need to do to the current specifications. So the first is that we need to be able to include data about facilities in the, um, the paging specification. So at the moment, um, people are, those, that, those people who are supporting the opportunity data model 
are, are publishing events. They're not publishing other types of information because that's what we focused on. There are a few different types of feed for people who were early adopters and haven't um, moved to the data model yet that are using a variety of different structures. And some of those are about um, facilities. So I think there's some table tennis uh, tables in there, for example. But we need, to, we need to be able to kind of, I think, more clearly flag about what type of data, is it events or is it facilities that is in a given feed? Then for a given facility, we need to be able to associate a facility with a place. So where is it? Um, associate the facility with the activities that um, it can, um, can, can take place within or on or using that facility. Uh, and then associate events, so slots with facilities to support the description of availability. Um, now we can already describe the availability of an event. Um, there's already the whole set of uh, terms around that. So if we can reuse that, we can simplify the process of um, adjusting the specifications. Then the third requirement, um, which again touches on a, a discussion we had uh, in November, is how do we efficiently check to see if a facility is still available to be booked? So whether a slot has been taken or not. Um, so the discussion we had there was around um, uh, if slots are you know being quickly booked how do people stay on top how do data users stay on top of the fact that the availability is changing um, are we just going to um, expect people to reharvest, or is there different approaches that we, we might use to make that um, easy to do so those are, i think are the broad requirements so what i was going to do is step through each of those and, and um, propose some changes to the specifications to support it um, everyone happy with this so far Yep. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll trust you'll shout out if you're not. Um, so the first thing um, about including facilities data in the in the feeds. So at the moment, <clears throat> there's there isn't really much metadata in an individual feed. Um, it just has um, a list of items, a next page, and a license. So I think what we need to do is to start to include a bit more metadata um, that. Uh, will help somebody who's harvesting that feed understand what it is that they're actually getting. And then they can use that to make a decision about actually, I'm not interested in events, I only want facilities or, or vice versa. So I think the way that we do that is just to include a, um, I've got it highlighted here at the top, we just include a new key, um, name to be agreed, but it, what that key would do was in, identify the type of thing that will be in the list of items that will be the top level in the items. So for existing feeds, this is always events, but what we'll be able to do is then start to indicate that a feed uh, contains facilities instead. Um, I think we've already got some open issues to, to cover additional metadata in feeds. And, and a couple of things that I'd like to get in there as well is identifying what version of the feed spec this particular feed supports and what, what version of the opportunity data model it's using as well. Because I think that's important for end users because uh, they may have to make some different decisions about how they process the data. Okay, uh, does that make sense so far? Just on that, what, what's the benefit of having the feed object over the, um, the just looking at what's in the item? Just that. Um, because it, um, you'll be, you're going to, because people might have a mixed feed, so you might want to identify it's this thing or an array of things, so you can make some filtering rather than just peeking at. The first item because that not, might not be reliable. Um, okay, uh, so that's I think the, the only things that we need to do in order to change the feed spec um, to, to at, least, at least to introduce facilities. Um, in terms of dis, uh, describing facilities, so we're starting to publish some data about it, we need a new type of thing in the data model. So at the moment we we just we've got events, um, um, organisations, etc. So we need facilities, um, and we need to identify some subtypes, some different types of facility. So squash courts, table tennis tables, etc. Um, and there's existing data and categories that we can use there, rather than having to spend a lot of time defining them ourselves. Uh, the reason we need to do this is, um, you know, again, people want to be able to filter. Um, the data because they only want squash, uh, they want to support um, booking of squash courts. They're not interested in, in football pitches, for example. Um, but once we've defined this new type, we can use existing bits of the data model 
to do the heavy lifting for lots of the other stuff. So we've already got a way to associate um, something with a place, a location, because we're doing that for events. So we can reuse the same terms there. Um, we can already associate uh, events with activities. So we'll be able to do the same thing with a facility. Um, and the way I'm proposing that we associate a, a facility with its slots is by using the existing um, event data model. So each slot is an event. We'll come back to that in a, in a second. So at, at a very basic level, uh, the data would start to look like this. Um, so uh, we've got, we, we could reuse all the existing properties. So name, description, um, images, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we would, you would say that something was a type of facility rather than an event, which is what people are using now. There's a couple of different ways um, within the existing model that we can indicate the type of facility. We can either uh, just define them all up front and um, um, people use it in the type property, uh, or we can use a, another feature that is in schema.org, which allows you to say, an, associate an additional type with a resource. And we could just use, um, we can just use a list there that could grow over time a bit more easily than revising the core specification. Um, and what, we can come back to this later, but what I'm proposing we do is we draw on um, the list of uh, different types of facility that's in active places already, because they've already kind of uh, charted a lot of this. But in terms of saying that this facility is in a particular location, so it's in the leisure center, we've already got ways to do that. We can already tag it with activities if we want to say that, you know, this particular pitch could be used for these different types of sport. Um, you know, there's, there's no need to kind of remodel uh, all of that. Um, so in terms of the, the slots, again, I think what we, we draw on is the, um, the event data model. So um, currently, um, we've got uh, different ways of, of describing events. Um, and what people are doing is that they are, um, in their existing feeds, most people are publishing an event and then some sub events. So which are, are kind of like slots. It's kind of times that um, say a gym class might be running or they're um, instead defining a schedule. So again, I think we can use this to describe the slots. So a facility could be to have an array of an events associated with it. So if you wanted to enumerate all of the slots that the facility was available for, you could just spell them out. So we can already use the start and end date, which specify the time period. Um, we can associate uh, uh, offers with events, so we can put a price against it. Um, so there's no need to remodel that. Um, and I think the only adjustment we might want to make is currently we have um, a status uh, property, event status, that allows you to say whether an event is um, postponed or cancelled, etc. And what I think we should do is just define uh, an available or unavailable status code. So you can easily say this slot, easily determine this slot is, is gone or this slot is still available for booking, just as a quick check. Um, because the, the existing way that we're handling availability is just by describing the number of participants, which doesn't make sense here. You just want to know if this event is available to you or not in terms of um, the offer. So there might be better ways to do that, but that's, that's kind of, a, I think, a start for 10. Um, uh, what's people's reaction to that so far? I mean, I think it's fairly minimal change, but I think it covers the, the first two sets of requirements. Yeah, it all looks good to me, Lee. Um, I didn't think there would be too many changes from the um, event specifications and doesn't seem like there's much, much, many changes to do. So that, that all seems positive from our, from our front. Okay, great. Cool. Um, okay, so the, the, I think the, the only other thing that's, that to talk about, I think really is the third item, which is, being able to efficiently, efficiently check if an event is still available. So um, at the moment, um, the default mode for any changes to any of the data is that people need to re-harvest it. So if, if new offers or prices get added, people just uh, tweak the description, change the time, everything needs to be re-harvested. So as a kind of fallback, um, we can rely on re, you know, people re-harvesting regularly. Um, as a way to pass through availability information. So that can be, I'm going back, 
um, whether the status has changed, for example, or whether there are new slots available. Um, but I, I kind of, I, I, I think that over time, just relying on reharvesting is going to be problematic for us in general because there are so many, there could be an awful lot of churn, particularly on um, uh, feeds that have very popular events or facilities uh, or are publishing a large amount of data. So what I'm proposing is that we define a new endpoint specifically for the purposes of checking availability initially. Um, so there's basically a restful call you can make in order to, to say, is this event, um, and that might be a, an event that, um, that is, you've, you've identified within a schedule, is this event still available? I think that could be quite, quite cheap to implement for a platform. Um, it could be expanded to include you know, additional, um, uh, all the additional data that you have about an event or facility, but I think the, the, the initial use case we have at the moment is just that availability information so that somebody can do that quick real-time check. Um, is, this, is this slot available? I kind of think we need this when we get getting into booking anyway, because somebody will need to be able to do this kind of live check before initiating a booking workflow, because you don't want to, um, you can't, you can't be reharvesting at that point. Um, so that endpoint uh, could be something that we could that could be advertised from within the feed. It could be part of the feed metadata as well. Um, I think we already recommend in the data model that every event has got a unique identifier and ideally has a URL that um, could be used to get information about it. Um, we might be able to just rely on that uh, as a way um, to expose some machine readable data, but I kind of think an explicit endpoint uh, might be um, a better option. Um, so each of when we've got uh, an event that's uh, that's fully specified in the feed rather than being via a schedule, then you can associate um, that, you, you could associate that URL directly with the event. But uh, another approach is to use your uh, URI templates um, to specify how to construct the URL uh, to check the availability of any event. So what the URI template would, would say is things like, for this base URL uh, and this, uh, take it, um, tack on the event ID and you'll get back an availability check availability status or plug in the date and time and facility ID and you'll get back um, an identifier so I get back a, a status, um, status check um, so be using URI templates it gives flexibility for each individual platform to decide for itself how uh, that check is implemented um, without us having to specify it all we need to specify is um, how to map um, data that is already in a feed, already in the, the event descriptions or facility descriptions into that template and then what the response should look like. Um, any thoughts or comments on that as an approach? Was that a thumbs up, Tom? Yeah, yeah sorry, I just uh, unmute myself. Yeah, that all sounds, sounds sensible and necessary, um, especially in terms of the real-time check. Um, yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Hi, so this is Ed from Bookingberg. I'm just, just to clarify, is it, uh, so it's a, a single API call that then uh, checks for a specific time if that slot is available? Yeah. So that could be quite a lot of calls if you say got um, half hour slots and something running for eight hours a day um, and you want to show a whole week that, that's that's a lot of calls um yes yeah i guess it is yeah i mean the alternate is that you we have the, the same mechanism um but just for um pulling down the information about the facility so you, you just you pull it'd be less calls but um a, a bigger response i suppose because you'd in that response you'd include um the data on all of the slots yeah, I guess I guess that way round is is closer to what we already do is is just pulling all of the slot times and using that. But yeah, I can see the value in in being able to check a specific time as well. So yeah, it does make sense. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if if we go this route, then we it can be used for other purposes than just checking availability. It'd be a way for to, somebody to sync um, uh, 
uh, you know, sync any cache data that they have if they wanted to. You know, it doesn't doesn't remove the usefulness of the feed, but um, it, it provides another way to kind of do that cache clearance. Sure. Yeah. In the, um, the book when scenario, there was a useful uh, the URI templates would have been useful there because they have um, they have a schedule and they generate the events based on the schedule at the point of booking if the event doesn't already exist. And so that that template is a good. Um, I mean, it's not facilities, but that would certainly have helped that. Um, but that would have been uh, the booking URL embedded would have been would need to have included URI templates. So I guess what I'm wondering is. Is there a way that we can uh, enable URI templates to be used in other URLs, such as the URL of an offer or the URL of an event? Yeah, I think so. If we go this route, then what we could end up with is um, just include a, a, um, a, a, a in the feed. It's a, it'd be like a discovery document. It's just going to have you know this is URI templates for events. This is it for facilities. This is it for individual slots. And then a, a client can, can bootstrap into uh, making a call as soon as it's already harvested some data. So I think there's, there's a way to, I mean, if, if it was going to get, um, if we were going to end up with a lot of information in there, it might be useful to publish the discovery document separately, which is what some APIs already do. Um, but given we're asking people to pub always publish a feed, putting it into that, you know, fetching the first page is relatively cheap anyway. Um, but, you know, I'm willing to take. Um, comments on that because um, I can see you know there are some pros and cons. You know the, the template could be fairly static, so it could be cheap to cheap to do. Whereas the harvest you're still going to do, you're still going to assume that somebody might want to be might want to get the the latest items. So there's a bit more work. Um, so the the thing that I wanted to highlight that this doesn't address, um, which we did discuss, is it doesn't deal with this the more complex use case of where you might want to be able to say this sports hall can be, you know, can be divided up into separate courts, you know, could be, you know, reconfigured to be used in the different ways um, and, and find some way to communicate that with, to users. Um, what I'm proposing here is that um, that's hidden away within the platform that's exposing the facility and that if somebody, you know, if you've got a big sports hall that contains a squash court, if somebody, um, books up the squash court, then they can no longer book up the sports hall and that, that the availability of the sports hall would change as a consequence. Um, there's, I think there's a whole lot of kind of complex logic around um, this broader use case that I, I'm not seeing a huge, I'm not seeing a clear need for at the moment. I think what I've outlined so far seems to address the initial requirements, but I just wanted to flag that up in case anyone felt strongly that that, that needs to be thought through in more detail. Um, Nick at, um, at Sport England. <laughs> um, that that this was something that you, you'd mentioned in our previous discussion. I just want I wanted to kind of check with you um, kind of what you thought yeah, about that. It, it's, I mean, you're right. In these ways, it's being more exposed back to um, the platform to deal with it. And you don't really want to expose it. I mean, it, there will be a lot, and it's the same with pictures as well. You can have the same issue. Um, I suppose it, it's when the when the consumers looking for something and understands the activities of the football, and they're looking at the facility and, and then understanding well, what, how do you translate the type of activity they can actually book between? And again, it goes back to that list of activities to make sure we've got the right ones. Because if you've got a pitch marked out, or if you've got a full size synthetic, for example, you might be looking for it to be eleven aside, and the football as a football isn't going to be big enough, a good enough description. So you can book, you can break that pitch up. You might say seven aside, look for seven aside. And therefore it would, it would kind of know that there were slots available, seven aside slots available, rather than just purely looking for that wider football. Or if you're desperately looking for an 11 side pitch, it would only be only those ones where there's actually no bookings at that time will be available. And I think when you probably in reality, you'll find very, it's very hard to find particular peak periods, 11 side pitches actually like that. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's my way, it's one of those things that you, that 
you, it, it's going to be a bit of a test and learn once you expose this thing and over time what actually works and you might have to come back and kind of readjust it yeah okay okay yeah i mean i, I no go ahead i was going to a specific point there is that the, the pricing of those individual uh, types, so seven aside and 11 aside, would probably be embedded in the products which we're talking about exposing. So I guess they would need to split, the booking system would need to split out the ability to book half and full courts kind of anyway and, and relate between them just so that you would know how to do that and how much it would cost. Um, yeah. Yeah, you'd be able to tell from the price, you know, difference between, you know, 100 a hundred pounds is going to be a full size pitch and you know 30 quid is going to be the, the price of roughly a, a seven a side so the user if they do it if they know about the sport will probably be able to differentiate that quite quickly but it's again it might be it's more about the some of this might be some of the guidance that goes back to the operators or what how they do some of their descriptions to get pushed out with some of the data Oh, that's a good point, um, Lee. With, with the um, squash court, I know it was a, one of the earlier slides, you mentioned an event type of squash court. Is the, uh, is the idea here that we're going to have one for seven aside, one for 11 aside? Are we going to redefine? Because I know there's also an 11 aside football activity and a squash activity uh, in the activity list. So how does that relate to the additional type here? Um. I, I think those would be handled uh, as, so I wouldn't necessarily, um, I'm trying to articulate what I was thinking. I guess for the case of like a seven, if you want a seven aside pitch, then you, it may need to be, but it could just be in the activity. You could, we, what we could do is just a football pitch that can support Act when in the activities description it would just say seven aside and then you can filter so you could easily find all of the football pitches and then filter down to activities that are, for those that support a seven aside versus five aside so we, what i don't want to end up doing is, is putting all of the potential things that be described as activities into facilities because i don't think that's that makes sense um it might be worth mapping the um well i just i mean imagine that, that um tom and jamie and, and nick probably all have a list of facility types including seven side five aside as basic filtering functionality in their existing apps so i don't think it's worth having that, that doing that comparison yeah it'd be, it'd be interesting to know yeah i mean i've got um i was going to show this later but i can show it now that so um uh, sally you can couldn't make it today um uh she was look, doing some, doing some investigation on the um, active uh, places data. So I asked her to pull out the lists of types of equipment and facilities that are already in there. So in active places, the equ equipment is things like, um, you know, high bars, parallel bars, but table tennis tables are indicated as a, an equipment in the piece of equipment in there. Um, in terms of facilities, um, lots of the facilities are, do have overlap with the, the activities. Um, and then subtypes, yeah. I mean, it's very similar to the, I think the, the list of activities that Sport England gave. Um, so it would, I, I, I think we need to avoid getting too bogged down in spelling out all of the different types of facility. But um, so if we've got useful lists that people are happy to share, that would be great because we could start to put those into the into the specification. Yeah, we're happy to share. Uh, our current list and if that will be of help then yeah we'll, we'll, we'll share it with the group yeah okay yeah i mean we can do we can try to test this out with more examples as well and just see how it looks in in, in the data model to, to see what would be useful for people well, um so slide, cool. Sorry, one, one more no, go, go ahead on that slide there just uh the a quick question on the contained uh contained in um the, I've, I've had to previously had a bit of feedback because I know GLL is the only folks to have used that particular key so far. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the data is not as obvious as it could be in terms of the location, which is the kind of key information with the postcode and all the rest of it. It's kind of moves 
moves around in, in, in the structure depending on how many contained in places they're embedded inside or if it's just at the root level. Um, so I'm just wondering for this in terms of simplicity, is, is there any reason why we couldn't use location uh, the same as we've got in an event? There's a clear location. Um, yeah, um, we, yeah, we could do. Um, the reason I, I, I think I put that into the example was that I was, I was trying to decide uh, whether facility is just a kind of something that could be described as being in a location or rather than having a location, but it's just a kind of a bit of semantics um, that is probably not that important. Um, okay. But it, the important thing is that, that there is there are some choices available in the existing model, so um, we can build on those. Yeah, it would be uh, good to kind of define whatever it is that we define, like just define it cleanly so that we users they know where to look wherever it is that they can look. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, would it, um, so it seems like uh, at least everyone on the call here seems reasonably comfortable with, with this outline. Um, so in that case, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to um, start uh, revising the both specifications to put those in. So we've got drafts that people can start um, uh, commenting on and I can circulate this, these slides and those drafts to the, the wider group so that we, we get more eyes on it. Um, but I'm confident we can kind of uh, move this forward quite quickly because I, I don't think it's a kind of radical change in direction for us which is good because I know that um, some people are waiting for it. Um, it would be good to start lining up um, some uh, uh, implementations um, so, pe so people who could be uh, start to use this part of the data model to start to conform to the standards. I think there are, as I mentioned earlier, I think there are a couple of non-standard feeds that might be able to be moved over to a more standard structure once we have this in place. Um, but I'm sure that there are other platforms that could be publishing facilities data. Um, so I, I know Nick, you, you've been doing a few discussions around how we might move that forward. Do you want to say anything briefly on that? Uh, yeah, just that we're, we're in the community, we're just looking at um, anyone that's interested in implementing facilities uh, feed. As a, as a kind of start of attempt to see how that works. And so there's a few, there's a few organizations who are already kind of involved in that. Um, so there's, um, so Fusion, um, Blade, uh, School Hire, um, potentially, um, oh, Sports, and also potentially, um, I think everyone spoke here today, Bookings Plus might be interested in that um, as well. But the Bookings Plus was still confirming detail on that, but then, um, they, they seem pretty keen and this, this was something we just spoke about earlier so um so yeah so there's a few people involved um if there's anyone else that wants to get involved in implementing stuff around this to, as a trial um obviously the advantage of being involved in implementation from either the data user side or the data uh provider side is that well for the data user side if there's anyone interested in consuming that data then there's obviously a lot of data to consume so that could be useful uh, for the data provider side, um, it'd be great to get your thoughts on this and help shape it if you're able to, to do that. So, Yeah, that, that, that'd be great. I mean, and as a, a rule of thumb for, for new pieces of work like this, I'd like to be able to get, um, you know, both at least one publisher and consumer to be, you know, on board and saying that, yes, they could implement, you know, either they've done a prototype or they're already implementing it according to the spec because then we actually get validation that it is implementable and it is useful for real use cases rather than us being you know driven by um you know assumptions it's good to have that kind of uh, implementation check in place okay um so for the second half i'm gonna um go through some slides that um uh, sally prepared um based on her uh, review of active places, um, just, to be, just to kind of have a look how it aligns with the work that we've done so far and how it might be um, um, made more useful um, to the, the community, you know, so how we can kind of join up some of the existing data with um, what Sport England already publishing. Um, so just as a quick recap for those of you who haven't looked at it, um, it's a sports facilities database that's um, published by Sport England, so activeplacespower.com. Um, it's currently available, the data is available in, in, in several different ways. Uh, there's an API, 
Um, you can download CSV and JSON files, and there is a paged um, uh, data exchange endpoint as well. Um, so there's a variety of different ways that it can be uh, consumed. Um, the, the model is um, well documented. The data is published under an open license. Uh, it's a variant, I think a slightly, slight variant of the open government license. Um, or well, might be identical, I haven't done a kind of word by word comparison, but it looks like it's an open government license. Um, and there is a, some documentation and developer tools in place as well. Um, the, there was a few th things that we wanted to try and look at. Um, so firstly, we were trying to determine um, uh, how the active places data model aligns with what we've got in the opportunity data model so far. Um, and I'd see whether um, the, well, firstly, whether the places data could be published according to the opportunity data model, or whether there's um, things that we might want to add into the opportunity data model uh, based on what Active Places is doing. Um, and at the moment, um, the our opportunity model is at a much lower level of detail than what is in Active Places, um, and that reflects the fact that Active Places is is supporting a, a slightly different set of use cases uh, than than we do at the moment. Um, and uh, it's the second bullet notes. Um, if we wanted to, um, if, if we want people to be uh, publishing this kind of place data in feeds, then it should be advertised. So it goes back to that, that point that I made earlier about adding some metadata so that somebody could say, identify that a feed is about locations rather than events or facilities. Um, our data model, as it, as it applies to uh, places, is, is pretty small. We've just got a fairly small set of features where we've, I don't think we've added anything on top of um, the model that is already in schema.org here. Um, so we, we've, well, that, we deliberately did that just to kind of uh, keep things light, um, just meet the immediate requirements for helping people find events. Um, Sally took some time out to try and match the, um, the Sport England data model. So the active places data model against the opportunity data model. Um, the detail isn't, isn't important, it shouldn't be readable. It's just to kind of highlight the fact that there really is a lot more detail in active places than, than we are asking people to publish. Um, so uh, that highlights the fact that there is potentially a whole rich set of data that um, existing uh, platforms and applications could be making use of if they're not already. Um, if they can find a way to kind of start to connect the opportunity data with that that's been published by um, in Sport England. So just to uh, give a kind of overview, this is the kind of things that are in the uh, Active Places data model at the moment. So there are sites which have facilities, they also have equipment, uh, and then there's additional information about each site. So uh, information on disabled access, contact points, uh, and also clubs. So there's a few things there that we're not really, that we haven't really addressed so far. Um, uh, I've shown this uh, spreadsheet of, of different, uh, different types of um, equipment. I'll circulate that to the list afterwards so that you can, you can take a look. Um, we've, got, we've got some counts in there. So um, table tennis tables are, are clearly quite popular um, in active places. <laughs> um, so in terms of similarities, so trying to identify you know, uh, alignment and potential improvements for our model. Um, so both have names and descriptions of places, both have some way to describe uh, facilities, but at the moment our model is quite light in that really we can kind of say there is an area, you know, a leisure centre has a hall within it, um, but that's as far as it goes. Um, both have geographic information address and contact details but the the details of the model is slightly different in each case um, but it does highlight for me that um that uh we know that some of the data that people are publishing at the moment might not have detailed address information it might not have geographic coordinates so actually doing some alignment or linking of existing data against active places might help people bring in this extra extra data into their systems which would enrich the information that they're publishing, you know, in addition to any kind of geocoding or other things that people are doing. 
uh, where there are differences, uh, there's a variety of things. So I mentioned address modeling. Um, we uh, recommend there's a URL for the place so that people can find it online. Um, whereas Active Places, I think, just has a, an ID. Um, there uh, mentioned different relationship between sites and facilities. Um, clubs is kind of wider scope. Um, one thing that ha uh, Sally highlighted here was um, that uh, we don't currently describe any opening times for places. I think there's support in schema.org for doing it, but we haven't asked, we haven't documented as that as something that people might do. Um, she was just highlighting that ad attaching opening times to facilities might be, we need to be clear on what that means as opposed to start and end times for events and facility slots because we'd be using probably similar terms to describe that. Um, so it'd be something where just we need some guidance for developers to make sure that they're, they're clear on what, what they're publishing and what they're using. Um, so what I think is quite promising is there's some fairly uh, obvious ways that we could start to connect some of the opportunity data to active places locations. So um, every active place site and facility has a unique numeric ID at the moment. Um, so on the next slide, I've just kind of shown two different ways that that could be um, added to um, opportunity data feed that people are publishing at the moment. Um, we could either uh, define a new active places ID field um, that people can then publish the identifier where they have it for the active place type. Um, that would mean a consumer could then uh, look in the active places data for additional information, so disabled access, parking, or etc. Uh, or there's a slightly different approach to how it be modeled, where rather than having a specific ID, um, we, we kind of identify it in a, in a bit more of an indirect, uh, indirect way. So we have an identifier, uh, we say what type of identifier it is, and then what the value is. Um, this is something that schema.org does. Um, and the reason it does it is because then schema.org doesn't need to define all of these different types of identifier. So it means that other systems can um, uh, start to publish their identifier schemes, um, which might come from different registers of information. Um, so it's a bit more open to extension then. So if other people have got um, location databases uh, that they want to um, reference from their opportunity data, then they can do. So it could be a way to um, include um, you know, identifiers from, I don't know, Foursquare or, or Facebook, et cetera, assuming that there's an appropriate license around them. Um, so I think that, that would be, I think, worth considering in this next round of specification changes as a, as a useful addition. Um, so just to kind of sum up, um, there, isn't, um, there isn't really a kind of, a, full alignment between active places and our opportunity model. They're coming from different different perspectives, supporting different needs. So I don't think we need to put a lot of work into trying to align them. The kind of core things there around, uh, you know, names, locations, et cetera. Um, active places has got a lot of detail, which isn't going to be um, directly important for uh, describing events and facilities. The fact that it's published under an open license in well-documented ways means that people can um, start to use that in their applications without us having to standardize it. Um, so we can start to use that data model to inform our work on facilities, as I've already outlined. Um, I think within the, within the program, we, can, we could be uh, perhaps making stronger recommendations around use of active places data by, by people who are going to be using the opportunity data. Um, it might be useful to help just, uh, drive some specific discovery use cases. So, you know, I just identifying that, that where leisure centers are and uh, other, other locations that Sport England are identifying. Um, as, I, and as I mentioned before, it can be used to enrich or improve existing data sets. You know, the fact that uh, the address or the information in their contact details, et cetera, uh, it makes sense to me that um, the platform should be using this rather than trying to um, collect their own uh, information. Um, and again, because we've got um, we've got uh, well, one of the streams of work for this year's of activity is around improving kind of documentation and guidance to support developers 
and publishers. I, I think we probably need to just have a sit down with Sport England and, and see if there's some additional things that we can do to um, to support people in using active places so they get get the most value out of the data that, that is being published. Uh, and then I think the final thing is, um, I think we, we have briefly touched on this in the past, but we, at some point we should probably come back to having a more detailed discussion around clubs. Um, so it might be uh, useful information to start to, to expose. Um, um, just think about, you know, whether there's, we've already got an organization uh, aspect of our data model and it'd be worth looking at how that, well that aligns with what is in active places as well. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where we got to with, with that alignment. Um, any comments or thoughts on that? Is anyone using active places already? Sorry, Lee, just to probably come back on a few things there about the potential use cases. I think it's more about how this gets, or you can signpost that to other people who are developing more, I don't know, more kind of a, a different approaches, how they might interact with consumer engagement. Because evidently the Active Places data set holds, I mean, it's designed for facilities planning. And everything is everything we have on there, or the dimensions, everything is all around minimal dimensions to play certain sports and what what is actually required to do certain things. So even down to this, to issues around clearance for badminton and whether you can actually play, their minimum specifications are around that. So where it, where the use cases start to become more important are for those people who are organising sport and probably more formal sport where they're searching for it. So they will look for certain things. We want to find a 3G pitch that has floodlights and it does this or it does that and those those are the kind of use cases where it will start to be is more useful so it, it's humble go mammoth actually use our online system to identify uh, uh, um, schools where they want to engage with it to open up those schools to actually offer those activities so they're different use cases but they're being driven by that additional kind of information so the other thing to kind of sort of just open is around the opening times, yeah, you wouldn't use our opening times. I mean, our opening times around, particularly for things like schools, is it, it's open at a certain time and, and the type of actual asset accessibility, it, it has that kind of stuff. So you wouldn't expect people to, if you're doing booking, to, to push out stuff when it's not available anyhow. You wouldn't use those active places, opening times for that kind of stuff. Um, and the other thing then, certainly we talked about the issues around dividing up courts or particularly pitches so in active places for example how we hold grass pitch data is different so we don't have individual ids for each grass pitch because on a national scale it's impossible because they are remarking them out and changing them every year so we will say on a site the facility subtype is full-size football and there are five of those pitches and there's a number five we're not giving unique identifiers to each of those five pitches Local authorities should do that for their booking system. We'll probably do that. Um, but we wouldn't do that on a kind of national thing because it's just too complicated to capture that type of information. Yeah, okay. Okay. That's useful to know. The, 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 that, that use case around kind of planning was quite, quite interesting. Because um, I, I, one of the things I've been wondering whether the opportunity data would support is more of that insight of, uh, you know, where where there might be gaps in people running events and then where there are those facilities that or facilities that are underused that you know people could be running using better making better use of the space yeah i mean certainly from our perspective you see when we talk about the opening hours in fact for a user for one of our people when we speak to the centers or getting them to update their data is always the hardest point so actually connecting the I suppose the timetabling information or information you'll get out of the center for those different facilities is very useful for us because that would save a lot of heartache on some of that capturing that data but it also it's very it actually for understanding how those centers are being used for us as an organization it's kind of very that will be very useful data it's data that we struggle to get out of people at the moment because it's all set up in all the multiple different systems so yeah there's a definite it would be more of a kind of that long-term development, but there'll be definite benefits of how we can actually join some of this stuff together more, so. Okay. Um, Great. Um, one thing sorry. I wanted to quickly flag on the identifier from the previous two slides before. I think identifier is currently being used in a number of data set 
uh, sets um, for representing the internal ID from the system's perspective. Um, so just flagging that that's uh, specifically quite a useful thing for the booking scenario because that internal ID is the thing that's then used to pass through to any native booking calls often um, to reference that particular thing. Um, so that, I mean, I'm, I don't know if there's a way that those two things can play together, almost allowing it to have an internal ID represented as well as whatever it other references. Yeah, yeah, I was I, I was aware of that when I was putting the example together. Um, you know, at the minute, I think we're just saying to people the identifier is a is a string value, but like everything in schema.org, you can have a there is a more structured way to do it. So if we were going to move to allowing this, then we'd need to think about what it means for existing data. Um, it may be that using this approach, it might be simpler. Um, and we just deal with the fact that there may be additional place databases down the line, um, just to just to have a bit more of a kind of standardized way to do it. Um, I'm kind of I'm mindful of the time uh, because it needs to wrap us up uh, uh, at three today. But um, has anyone got any other feedback on um, active places or on the early discussion around facilities? Okay, I'm going to take that as a no. Um, if anything just occurred to you afterwards, then uh, feel free to um, drop me an email or, or start a discussion on the mailing list um, so that we can start to get more people involved. Um, in terms of our next calls um, uh, and events, um, that we are running a workshop at the ADI offices next Wednesday. Um, if you are interested in participating in that and aren't already signed up, then I suggest dropping me or Nick an email depending on whose contacts you've got. Um, I think we've still got a, a couple of places available on that. The purpose of that workshop is to try and move forward um, with uh, booking in parallel to the facilities work. Um, so we thought that getting a few people around the table would be a good way to kind of move those discussions on. The, the next call that we'll be having here uh, on the 31st of January will be to recap some of the things that we've learned in that workshop and also give people who couldn't attend in person the opportunity to uh, feed in their requirements and into the discussion as well. Um, and I think then looking ahead to February, um, I, I think I had activity list in here from before, but it may be that we focus on booking depend on uh, uh, where the energy is in terms of um, driving things forward. Uh, so, I think that's it then for today. Um, I'll do a uh, quick summary of the discussion, um, circulate the slides and the other documents um, after, uh, later this afternoon uh, and then the video will go up online as well. So um, thanks all for attending and I'll uh, see you all either next week or in a couple of weeks. Cheers.